Enough, most of our work, or at least most of my work, takes place on the other side of the ocean, North America. So I've lined up um, a couple of projects that I've been working on myself over the last few, well, let's call it 10 to 15 years. And they're all dealing with the way we as human beings are reclaiming public space, or how we are reclaiming the city for us as pedestrians, as cyclists. Um, just as the user of the public space. I start with a bit of a theoretical story, but it is related to the way we think as landscape architects about the way we have to defend our landscape. Um, this is a proposal for um, New York and how New York had to deal with their city after Sandy hit the city. When Sandy hit the city, the whole downtown of New York was flooded. As you may have known then, this is the subway at uh, Central Park. You couldn't enter it anymore. So the whole city was blocked, or the whole downtown of, of New York was blo blocked because the water that took over the city. The coastline was even more devastated. There was more damage to the coastline. And these were just some images of that storm hitting Sandy. And Sandy basically put a halt on the whole downtown New York. How did that happen? Very simple. The hurricanes, they came, they pushed on the water. The water was pushed up at the coastline. And then it just flooded the city. So the sea level rising, we're all talking about sea level rising about a half a meter and a meter, but when storms hit the coastlines, we're talking about three, three to three to four meters high uh, of pushes of waves. So you need to think about what this means as a landscape architect living in your city, and you have to think about what this means. Because when Sandy hit New York, the blue areas is what flooded. It gives you an idea of the impact of just weather on our landscape. And these are the plans by the Army Corps. The Army Corps is basically the landscape department of the city of New York, well, uh, and I take, take the region of, uh, of New York. And this is how they think, okay, we have to protect our landscape against the flooding. Let's put up walls of four meter high. Just imagine, this is your existing landscape, and this is what you do when you take an engineer and you let an engineer do what he does. Imagine Brooklyn Bridge, you can't see the city anymore. It's protected behind this four meter concrete wall. So what do you do with it? This is where they wanted to build the walls. Just the red lines give you an idea of the, 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 the sea wall that they wanted to build to protect the landscape with. You see the red dike in, uh, in the cross sections down, down there. It shows you how to protect the landscape. We as landscape architects looked at it in a different way. If you just look at how the ocean works and how the, the, the hurricane pushes uh, the water up, you see where the, the, the problem areas arise. It's where the, 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 the sea is basically pushed into this canyon at the, at the city or at the mount of, of the Hudson. And you see that red area? That's where the real problem lays. It doesn't lay in your city, it lays outside the city. So deal with it outside your city. So we've decided to build a big dune on the outside of the city to protect the city on, on, its, on, on, its, on its own. And what it meant is by building a big dune outside the city, we could reduce all the dikes on the inside to a meter high. Instead of four meters, we're now only talking about four, uh, one meter of dike. And by building a, a sequencing of dunes in front of the coastline, we basically protect our landscape on the inside because now we can continue to enjoy that landscape on the outside. So, original image by the engineers, an image by the landscape architect saying, by just building a simple low dike, one meter high, build, make it in green, put trees on it, let people enjoy this, you, you, you basically save the city from the next hurricane that comes. And then you can design this out. What is a dune? How does the dune look like? What can we do more with it? Well, you could do something ecological with it, and you can say, okay, I have places where nature is taking it over, but I'm allowing people to enter that area as well. So I create a recreational area for the people of New York outside the city. It's a place for eco-diversity, it's where fauna and flora will grow. But it what it basically does is we're creating new landscape, landscape for people to take it over, to go and enjoy that place. 
Um, so we're creating place for us instead of taking it away. It's a strategy that we in the Netherlands have been using all over. Um, and I'm just showing some of the images because what is important is that we as engineers, I'll call us landscape architects, are also engineers, um, we think first, okay, how do we build it? And then we let nature taking it over. And we, we design with it and we continue designing with it and we say, okay, people will not, not only landscape takes it over or nature takes it over, but also the people will take it over. And you create a landscape that is allowing people to be there to enjoy that space. So it's creating places. And as the Dutch, we know how to do this. Sand suppletion sits in our blocks. So in the Netherlands, we're be, we've been doing this all over to protect our own coastline. And it's by just building sand, dumping a big pile of sand in the ocean, we're protecting our landscape, and we're creating places for people to hang in. This is Petter aan Zee. Um, we realized this last year, um, one of the weakest points along the Dutch coastline, by building a new dune, we basically created a protection wall from the sea to, to protect us in, on, on the inland. And it's just a very simple landscape uh, of sand, sandy beaches. There's nothing more to it, but it creates a landscape for us to take over as human beings, but it also allows us to build on it. We've been thinking about how do you build on those islands? Can we not only do nature there? Can we allow people to go and have fun on it? But can we also live on it? And how does that then look? So we've been doing a lot of studies about reclaiming public landscape from um, the water. This is the coastline of the Netherlands and the proposal that currently lays there to protect us against sea level rise. And we allow people to live there, as in we want people to live in those neighborhoods. Another example about claiming on the big scale, reclaiming public landscape on the big scale, this is an island, uh, the one in the middle, that is a proposal from us to think about how we deal with the flooding of the river, the Schelde in, in, in Antwerp. That river needs to be dredged just to make sure that the big container ships get into the harbor. That dredging has been pushed away and dumped away. And we were like, oh, what if you do something fun with it? What if you build an island with that dumping material to allow nature to take it over and to allow people to take it over? So even on the big scale, we as landscape architects have a fundamental question to answer is how do we reclaim landscape for us as human beings? Just a few examples of how that works. Completely different scale, but it's again about reclaiming landscape and making landscape accessible for us as human beings. Uh, Longwood, Longwood Gardens. Um, I'm taking you to Philadelphia. Um, Longwood Gardens is a beautiful estate. It's a private uh, garden, fully publicly open. Um, and they called us with the question, can you write us a master plan to think about how we open our garden even more? How do we maintain our garden? How do we um, allow people to enjoy this garden even more? And you see it already in the background, beautiful landscape on the side, a very um, historical garden on the inside with a beautiful greenhouse on the back. And what the client asked us is to think about how can this garden be part of a series of very popular gardens all over the world. From Villa d'Este to Versailles to Kyoto, how can our garden be in the same league as theirs? Um, their garden is about 207 acres thick, so 102 hectares but the core itself is only 22 hectares big, and it's where the people are coming to, it's where people are enjoying going to the show gardens, looking at the way people are building their gardens, looking at shows, um, looking at greenhouses and how the orchids are growing, and uh, uh, many more. This project sits in a very, very beautiful landscape. It sits in the Brandy Valley, and the Brandy Valley looks as follows. Just a very simple, inundating landscape with grass, where, where people can walk in, backdrops of existing trees. So it's a very beautiful, subtle landscape to work in. And then this is the site even more in detail, the historical map. And what is important to tell about is this garden is privately owned. It is owned by the family Dupont. And Dupont is the engineer who built the soap, who invented the soap, and, and has a as a multi-million dollar company at this moment. 
And he went on a travel. He went on a lot of travels around uh, the globe. And what he brought back with him were IDs of historical gardens and how he and he went basically wanted those historical gardens in his own garden. So he recreated those gardens. Um, question by the client asked is how can we untangle the mess that we have today? And we said it is only one solution is to look at your landscape again. And the landscape is very simple. I showed the images of the existing landscape. It's the topography. Think about the topography and how the topography is organizing your landscape. The images show it yourself, but basically what it meant is that there was a high part in the garden, which is the orange part, and this two sides, there's two valleys on either side. So if you, if you take that as an organizing method, you can basically say all the buildings, all the main functions sit on the ridge line, on the higher part. You've got your landscape on the north side and you've got your gardens fully orientated onto the sun, the south side. That meant that we could rethink the way the organization of the garden works, we could rethink how the entry of the garden works, now you're entering this way instead of via the back door. Um, and it basically gave the client a very simple methodology to maintain and operate his garden on a master plan level. We drew the master plan drawing, made a big booklet with it saying, here's your master plan, deal with it now. And then they came back, a half a year later they came back to us saying, well, you know that historical garden that we have, it's a bit old and it needs to be renovated. Can you help us with that? And we said, of course we can help you with that. These are just some of the images of the existing situation showing you how that garden looked like when we arrived in 2009 on site. An, over, an overall view of how that garden looks like. And of course we can help as landscape architects. We took it all away. <laughs> but we brought it all back. Um, what did we do? Um, this garden is used as a fountain garden, which basically means that they hold, every weekend they hold fountain shows. Fountain shows that look like firework. I'll show some pictures later on. In the ID of Dupont as an engineer, we said, okay, let's put a big massive tunnel underground to feed the pumps, to feed the uh, fountains with water. So think about this structure, the, the space we're sitting in, full with ducts, underground that feed the fountains that stand on the roof of this structure. We hired the best of the best of fountain designers. Um, if you've ever been in Las Vegas, you went to the Bellagio, well these guys who designed that, they helped us designing these fountains again. And so what we did is we rebuilt the fountains so that they could be at a level of European and worldwide class fountain shops. Just some images of the fountains after opening day um, last month, it's just finished. Gives you an idea what you could do with water in a historical garden, with fountain. So as part of the removal of the whole garden, we said that limestone, the whole garden was built out of limestone from Italy. Let's claim it back and fully restore it. Every piece, and there were about 40,000 pieces of granite, have been restored by men. Piece by piece have been recladded, refurbished, re beautified and then brought back as a puzzle piece on site. Step by step, pieces were brought back into each other and they went into the garden. Keep in mind, the landscape architect is in lead here and he has not done anything to date at this project in these images. So it's a full restoration project, just as an ID, $90 million project, that's what we're talking about. So what did the landscape architect do? Well, the landscape architect was asked with the question, if I have a bucket of water, and I take just a bucket of water with 10 liter of water in it, and I turn it upside down, that water that falls on a half a square meter needs to be gone within 10 minutes. That's the question asked by the client, because what they did is you've got fountain shows, so you've got a lot of people coming onto the, into the garden, and that needs to be dry. So we have been thinking about a way of dealing with this issue, water. Well, the first step we did was we took all the soil off site. We sterilized it so that there's no disease, no bugs anymore in it. We 
did a secret mix with sand and soil and uh, nutritions and we brought it back on site but we brought it back on site with a fully engineered irrigation and drainage system underground so basically put thousands of tons of granular base on the floor and build it up with planting or with, and build it up with soil again now as a landscape architect i still haven't done anything i just engineered the place so what does the landscape architect do in this case? Besides organizing the whole uh, exercise, he came with very simple ideas about, okay, we need to build a new grid of trees, a canopy of trees around this, so that people can walk in the shade, but also allow people to walk into an area that was previously not that fully accessible. So this garden is now fully accessible for wheelchair, for strollers, for people who are dis disabled, who are blind. Um, who can now start enjoying this garden. And they do that in this promenade of trees. Special furniture has been designed for this place to allow people to enjoy. And then what happens on the inside? The inside is really, it was a historical boxwood garden, so let's do something fun with that. When you think about boxwood, you could think about, and I'm gonna to speak to the women at this moment because ladies understand this. Men, when ladies make them Makeup. There's different ways to think about that. Either you do a, an eyeliner and you eyeline your garden, or you go one step further and you do something fun with everything that sits around your eyebrows, like you know, Cleopatra was doing, and then you can design that as well. Can you design a boxwood lands landscape that does something like the way she was dealing with her eyebrows? And so we've been designing a, we call it a braid by now, um, a design of Buxwood. Is this something new? Absolutely not. It is historical as can be. The French, they did it before us. So let's use that experience to build this garden with. And so what we build is a Buxwood scheme of Buxwood that is as a cloud growing into each other. Um, and we use it all over the garden. We've rendered this out. We've sh drawn thousands of details to the clients to explain this but it never worked. So the only way to do it is to build a mock-up in reality, go to your backyard, buy those boxwoods, show to your client, this is how we're gonna group them together into what we call the braid. Um, and then at that moment, it was obvious for the client that that is what they wanted. And so we started with building seven and a half thousand boxwood balls, were brought onto site, and one by one installed into this garden. And, um, we're allowing them to grow for two years before we're going to shear them into the shape. Um, but it gives you an idea of how this garden will start to grow. And um, this is a project that has been built over a year and a half. We've opened it last month in May with a big bang. And these are some of the images of how the garden opened to the public, where you see the boxwood, you see the grass coming together, you see how fountains are working together with this whole garden. And for the first time, this garden was fully accessible. People were allowed to go to the fountain. Are they allowed to play in the fountains? No. Do they do that? Of course they do that. Do we mind it? No, we don't mind. But it gives you an idea of how a non-accessible garden transforms into an accessible garden for people to enjoy and to, to hang out into something that is there as a gift for them. So every week now, if you're, if you're planning to go to the States and you're in the neighborhood of Philadelphia, travel two hours south, go to Philadelphia, go to the Longwood Gardens and enjoy one of those uh, fountain shells because it is really marvelous. I didn't know that they could do this with water. It's beautiful. We're going up north to Canada, um, Toronto, and it's all about, as in I built my whole conversation about the way we reclaim public space. This is the back side. Actually, it is the front side of the city of Toronto, but this is how we deal with it. It's a parking lot. But at the same moment, when you look at it in the perspective and you look at where it lays within the city of Toronto, it lays so close by because where you see this tower, the big CN Tower, that's where the downtown Toronto is. So it's really, really close for people to use. It's not been used. So the question to us, how do you reclaim that again? 
just an image of the existing situation. You see how close downtown is, so people want to use this space, but it is a parking lot. And that's the view to the lake. So we've been thinking vision-wise, what do we do here? And it's all about the view line. And it's all about thinking about the Canadian landscape and the identity of that landscape. So the identity of the Ontarian landscape is what we call the Canadian Shield. And the Canadian Shield is a landscape that is defined by the way water meets land. If you look at the image, water, rock, tree. Those are the agreements, ingredients of the landscape. That's what we've built the park with. So it's a green oasis now. It's fully accessible with a continuous loop for people to walk, to bike, to cycle uh, in. And it's defined out of two zones, a higher park and a lower park. Higher park, really close, people are sitting under the trees. And an open park where people have a very open park feeling, sitting on a lawn, enjoying uh, the, the beach. The reference images to show what we wanted to the client. And that evolved into a, a, a project to, who has clear identifications, clear identities defined to it. We speak about an entrance feature, we speak about a romantic garden, we speak about a lawn for people to enjoy. Here's how we enter the garden. As part of English landscape style, you never see the garden immediately. So we went through a ravine. So you see the ravine and through the ravine, with the bridge over it, you walk towards uh, the landscape. These are pictures that I took last week with the opening of the park. Uh, so it's still growing, it's still part of uh, a growing process. And as part of walking through this ravine, we decided that it was important to give the local inhabitants of um, Canadian um, a place. So we put, we, we, we went in conversation with the local inhabitants by how do you want to remember that this was formerly your land? We're talking about the Indians. And in a lot of conversations with them, we came to the idea that the Moncassin, which is the shoe that they're wearing, um, is an identity to them. And so we brought that element back into the ravine wall itself. It's an engraving into a granite wall that allows people to rethink that this was formerly their landscape. So it's a remembrance to a place. It's thinking about how we connect with what was in the future, or in the past, sorry. When you enter, when you go through this ravine, you open the, you walk into the romantic garden, an open lawn with rocks um, that that are just stacked on top of a higher part of the, the garden. It's fully used, can be fully used by people. It was the first weekend after opening day, and people took over the park like never before. It was beautiful to see. Um, so it's a very open lawn, so that events can take place, so that people can hang out in this place. And there's one very important program element in it. It's a building in it, it's a pavilion in it that allows the park to be fully programmed so that people can take it over, can shelter in this place, uh, and that events can take place. <laughs> Reference to it is the pine tree. Um, it's, a, it's a wooden structure, fully built out of uh, the, um, uh, cedar wood with a, a zinc roof on top of it. When we walk through the the narrowest part of the park, we thought about the bluffs. And the bluffs is basically a rocky wall. And um, what do you do with that? How can you translate that? And we've thought about stacking stones on top of each other because it's that reference to the, granite, uh, to the Canadian shield that is so important. So we stacked stones on top of each other. And that became, in a way, a playground for people to enjoy and to hang out in this neighborhood. Um, and so you, oh, in a way, Although we're talking about an identity of a place, like the Bluffs, which is a, a, a stone landscape, we allow people to take it over. This is a fire pit in this landscape. That's not a problem, it can just take place within it. And then the, the tip of the park is what we call the summit. It's where people will go to enjoy the close-by airport and to enjoy the sunset of um, the, the, the well, sun into, the disappearing into the lake of Ontario. And it's an, it's an open hill that allows people to enjoy the, nearby, the, the, the fact that they're nearby to, to, to the city. So, two weeks ago it was the opening, the day after the whole park was packed because people really wanted to start enjoying the space because they have a need to it, they have to find a place to enjoy it.
and we're going to continue in Toronto, a project that I've been living for since 2008 now. Um, when I joined West State, we won an international competition for the revamp of the public space uh, of Toronto. It's a, a project of three and a half kilometers long and about 800 meters wide. And the question posed by the client was to rethink the public space because the public space was non-existing. This is 1918. You see a railway corridor. That's where the formal lake of Ontario was and where the city was meeting each other. Over the many years, the city has built upon its lakefront by dumping soil into the lake and creating and reclaiming new landscape for industrial purpose. Only in the 1985, people started to think about that the backside of the city, in this case the lake, is actually the most pleasant place to be. Is in you can live at the lake, you can read, uh, you can enjoy hanging around in um, the lake. And people started building there in a landscape that was fully dedicated to industry. We're talking 2009, 2010 when I came on board and we looked at this landscape and we looked at it in a way that this is not very friendly landscape for people to go and enjoy, to have, to have fun in. Um, people are living here. There's a streetcar running here in the middle, two lanes of traffic on either side, and there's a very, very narrow sidewalk on either side. So the question posed to us was, is there in any way that US designers can come up with a strategy to reclaim public space so that you can walk in it, so that you can bike, uh, that you can cycle in it, that you enjoy this public space. And again, we looked at what is the identity of the Canadian landscape. The, the identity of the Canadian landscape is not only found in pictures, it's found in images, it's found in art, it's thinking about that relationship between water and landscape, and how does that relationship work. And not only you find it in art or in images, you even find it where people are going to shop, telling them, this is your landscape, go and enjoy it. But instead, we had that other landscape. So we've asked ourselves, is there any way that we can mirror the downtown of Toronto, three and a half million people living here, um, with the cottage landscape that they so enjoy? And we think there is. We're thinking of a multiplied waterfront that exists out of three layers, and I'm going to run through every of those layers step by step. Um, it's, in a way, not, not only a multiplied landscape, it's also a wo woven landscape that is integrated into one master plan with one element saying, reduce the amount of materials, simplify your details, and make it beautiful for public space. One problem. The average age of trees in Toronto is about seven years. So, landscape architects, what do we do? What do trees need to grow in? Well, there's a few answers to that, isn't it? They want water, they want air, and they want soil. Toronto Detail tells you compact everything till a depth of 1 meter 50 to 100%. Because we have a lot of frost and everything heaves here, so the landscape comes up and down. Compacted really well. Well, you know, if you do a 100% compacted landscape, there's no space for trees to grow. So we had to think about a solution to help the, the client saying, okay, we are going to compact the landscape 100% till 150 centimeter deep and creating space for those roots, for those trees to grow in. And the simple answer to that is plastic crates. This is a, a soil cell plastic crate, you put it under the ground, you dump it with full, with really good soil in it, you put an irrigation system through it that captures the water that runs, uh, that, that, that comes out of the air and, and, and falls on the landscape, you capture that, you put it under the ground so that you feed your trees with water and then you put a, a cover on it, you put a lid on it and then you compact everything on top of it. What it does is that the trees actually have 30 cubic meters of soil underground and nobody will see it and they live very happily. Three projects in it. The first line of defense, that's where people are basically meeting the lake for the first time. The second line is Queen Ski, is where traffic is driving, and then the third line is where pinch points or close areas are. The Water Edge Promenade is this continuous line along the, the lakefront that we've opened to the public by, def by defining and saying you need 18 meters of public space. 
and that is continuous. And there's no building in it, it's only a promenade, a double row of trees, a beautiful wooden uh, boardwalk on it, and that's how you open your public landscape to the lake. And so we filled it in with paving material, with trees, and the paving material is a double color system of a maple leaf in two uh, colors, a red one and a white one. Very kitschy in a way, but very handy when you have to deal with topography. And so after the many years, and you see what we've done, not only benches were custom made, light poles were that custom made, but we created a promenade for people to enjoy. And uh, these are some of the images of three or three, four years ago, and when we're going through it, and you see this one, for example, is a year ago. The city of Toronto had to come by for the first time in, as part of their maintenance plan, they actually had to come by five years earlier because the trees were so happy. Um, and this space is now fully used by all kinds of events. It's the place where people meet the lake. And because we're dealing with a slip, we're dealing with a harbor, you've got slip ends, so we've designed a series or a family of bridges to cross that in a very Canadian way um, with wood and um, some of them will be built, some of them will never be built, but it's about the vision to create this continuous public access along the water. And then the second line is Queen's Key. Queen's Key is a street that was previously seen as a barrier. People are coming from the north, so people are coming from there, and they're going to the south, where's the water? In between is this highway structure with a streetcar, two lanes of traffic in either direction, and very narrow sidewalks. It worked as a barrier instead of a pleasant entry towards the waterfront. And it worked in a way that, that, that people didn't want to cross this. So we had to invest in this one too. The investment is very simple. Reconfigure the whole landscape by saying, increase the sidewalk on the north side where your businesses are, reduce your traffic to two lanes and where need be a dedicated turning lane, streetcar in the middle and then everything on the south side give it away to cyclists and to pedestrians because that's who you want here. We can do this because of the fact that in the existing situation you had two lanes in each direction and people were using the curb to park along. So in reality there was only one lane in each direction available and then traffic jams arise at the intersection. So we said well if this is the existing situation, we can use one lane in each direction, but by adding a dedicated turning lane at every intersection, we ensure that there's no traffic jam. So what did we do? We currently built one and a half kilometers. We built, we planted about 240 new trees, three million pieces of granite cobblestones, 10 by 10 in the colors red and white, we then a full new track for the streetcar. All underground infrastructure was 80 years old, so we've rebuilt all of that and the landscape architect was in the lead here. And the, as a landscape architect, we made sure that the engineers were doing what we were telling them to do. However, sometimes the world is not that perfect. We had a document set that was this thick. Construction documents that we gave to the contractor, say and go and build it. Unfortunately, after day one, when the excavator arrived on site, I had to throw this document set into the garbage bin because my whole underground infrastructure was completely different. Will you see something about that in the landscape? No, because the landscape architect was in charge by saying, this is how we're doing it. Images of how the south side promenade looks like after the first year of opening. Um, it was packed. People were starting to enjoy and coming to the waterfront. Actually, there is not enough space for pedestrians to walk because the promenade is only 13 meters wide and it is not wide enough for people to walk in. Um, you see the reconfiguration of the granite, street furniture came in, light poles came in, all part of the same uh, language of the master plan for the, the waterfront of Toronto. And these are images that I took uh, earlier this spring. We see that people are taking, when you give the public space to the people, they take the public space and they go fully and enjoy it. And then people start to invent that the promenade can also be used for events. Fine by me, go and have fun on that promenade, because it is wide enough to do. For the first time in many years, people had a continuous bike path on the south side of the waterfront. And it was the missing corridor. Previously, there were about 10 to 20 bike bicycles using this area to travel through. 
before we came on site, and that's per hour. When we opened it, and we did the counting last year again, we have about 600 cyclists using this track every hour. So we went from zero to 600 within one year by just building a bicycle track to allow people to connect again with that landscape. And of course there's a graphic to it, but the function is more important. It's for the first time people are allowed to go to the waterfront, to enjoy the waterfront, to, to, con to continue from point A to point B by using a continuous uh, bike trail on the sun side. Pictures made at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, so don't expect a lot of uh, pedestrians and cyclists on it. And then the north side is transformed into a, I'll call it more of a terrace zone in the beginning. So we went from two meter sidewalks to sidewalks that are five meters in width, so that the commercial activities that are taking place in the plinth of the building actually have a space to spill out so that they can put the terrace. And um, by simplifying the material palette, we basically created a landscape that is fully accessible. Now when you're dealing with a old harbor, you have to deal with slip ends. When you are dealing with a plan, a master plan, that will take 15 to 25 years to fully implement, you need to strategically think about where do I spend my money to keep people happy. And one of those key elements were the slip ends. This is an existing situation of Spadina Wave Deck, uh, where you see how people in 2009 were using the public space. Very narrow sidewalk, and then a crash barrier, and then the water very deep. And we wanted to connect the people again with that landscape by saying, look at your reference image again, there's something that connects the landscape with uh, the water. And we created a series of wooden decks. Um, a wooden deck is actually an increasement of that public space, about 600 square meters, so that people could connect with that water that it's finally, that they finally could connect with what, that water that was laying there. And it creates a landscape that is very simple. It creates an event space, it creates a place for people to hang out, to enjoy the water, to um, look towards the lake, but also look back towards uh, the city. And it's a wooden deck, built out of cedar and ipe. Um, that is fully accessible. You build it over winter time uh, because there's something about the lake that you can't touch in the, in the, in the summer time. And so we've built a series of them. This is a simple wave deck with a more expressive shape of uh, a wooden structure that allows people to take over this space, to allow events to find place on those decks, to allow children to play on them as a playground. So not a formal playground, but a designed piece of furniture that allows people to take it over, that allows them to claim it and to have fun on it. I'm going to continue with reclaiming public landscape, but now I'm, we're going to Spain. Um, and sometimes, and I'm using this image for a very simple reason, sometimes you only need one strong person who says, this is what we're going to do. This is the mayor of, uh, of Madrid who decided that there's a fundamental problem within the city of, Toronto, of, uh, of, of Madrid is that the river was completely disconnected from the people who were living on the east and the west side. Um, it was disconnected because the main highway infrastructure was running alongside the river, which means that neighborhoods were disconnected from each other, from the river, and people had no place to go and enjoy uh, public space. So the question posed to us by the city, by the city mayor, was: I'm going to put the green circle. I'm going to put the infrastructure below grade to create park landscape. Help us designing that. And we said, well, it's very simple. If you look at the historical images of the city of Madrid, you see that the castle and city hall are directly connected to the river with green and with public space. That is the only answer you need to do. So we created a landscape of 17 kilometers along the river de Manzares, um, and we call it Salón de Pinos. And Salón de Pinos is basically using the identity of the Spanish landscape at that location to create a new identity with. Salón de Pinos is building on top of a thermal structure, a park landscape that sits on top of it. Um, slightly elevated so that we could plant a lot of trees on a concrete deck. Um, 
just some of the renders of how we presented the project in, uh, to the city. There's one thing that is very important in, in, in the work that we do as, as uh, West State is we very carefully look at how nature influences our landscape. If you go to a forest, if you go to a nursery, now if you go to a nursery, what you see are beautifully straight trunks. When you go to the forest, you will never see that. So we've been asking ourselves the question, if that is what we get, but this is what we want, how do we deal with that? In a way, the Spanish have been dealing with this idea of dancing and transforming elements all over. From Dali who painted it to uh, uh, the way they dance and the way they, uh, they play. And we've been thinking about what can we do with that with trees. Can we torture trees in one way that they're not beautifully straight trunks, but they have a bit of a shape in them, that they have a bit of a form in them. What we did is we planted all our trees under an angle and gave them a support. And so what you do, what happened is that we immediately said, okay, everything is planted in with, uh, with pines, or pl planted under an angle, supported, and there's a very wide sidewalk. It's actually more than a sidewalk. There's a, there's a promenade of about seven and a half meter that allows bicycles and pedestrians to merge into one and they can just start enjoying this landscape. So the simplicity of that, this landscape is about the forest of trees and the fact that you have a path to, run into, to allow people to take over this landscape. And the beauty of that is that very clever people are saying, you know what, let's rent this, let's, uh, let's make sure that you go and rent this, that you can, uh, can go and enjoy the landscape even more by renting out cycling, bicycles, by renting out go-karts, by renting out whatever you need. Simple, similar to what happens here on the square. Be smart and allow that to happen in your park. So it, the park is now fully opened, fully connected uh, to the people. That's not enough to create a place for people to go to. You need to make sure that there's programming. So we dumped all of the program that you think you need for a city into this park. From a skateboard park, to a, play, uh, a major soccer field, to playgrounds, all have been integrated in this one identity of this forest. And, and, and it's playing with the idea of the pine forest and it's building playgrounds with simple materials, but integrating them into one element. It's also about not being afraid of existing infrastructure. Integrate that into your design and have fun with it. And yes, so now and then you just want to have fun. Can you build slides? Besides program, you also want, in southern of Spain, you want a little bit of uh, fresh air, and that can only be done by water. So we've dumped in thousands of art features of water, just to cool down the landscape, so that people could go and enjoy the public space into this forest of pine trees. The next layer is color. Add bright colors into your design so that it becomes a place where people go and hang out. Make that Instagram moment standing in front of uh, the roses. It is important to the way we perceive public landscapes at this moment. Now there's one thing that is missing is east and west side of the river were not connected so we've introduced a series of bridges. Bridges are very important to us as landscape architects, and especially within West State, we believe that bridges are elements to walk through instead of walking over it. A bridge needs to be an experience, and the experience in this one is it's a concrete shelf built over the river. The shelf itself cools down uh, the temperature with two to three degrees. It's over the water, so it's really beautiful. Very, really refreshing to be there. But we did something fun with it. A local artist was asked to do a mosaic on the inside of the shelf. And what he did, what he came back with was the idea, I'm going to make pictures of the people who are living here. And those pictures, I will make a mosaic of them and I will hang that up on the ceiling. Those pictures are actually oversized. But what it did is that it connected people who are living in this neighborhood with the bridge, with the park. So they now own the bridge in one way or the other. In general, what did the park do for the city? It reconnected City Hall and the palace with the river by, by this green vein that runs on top of it. 
Are we still okay? As in, do you still want to see more pictures? Um, we're going back to Governors Island in. Uh, we're going back to New York. We're going to Governors Island. Uh, Governors Island is this island that lays in the middle of the delta of the Hudson, and it was formerly used as a military base downtown New York, just under the the, the, the clouds of uh, Manhattan. Um, so the army was owning this landscape till about 2008, um, when um, you see some of the images of the existing situation. When in 2008, the Trust Governors Island, a private funded organization, bought the island for one dollar, with one promise. It needs to be publicly accessible, fully publicly accessible throughout the whole year for everybody. And it needs to be a green oasis in the city of New York. Well, okay, that's the promise. So we have Manhattan, a green element in the middle that overlooks a Statue of Liberty. This is what we found. Not a very green oasis, if, I, if you ask us. Um, paved in with concrete, uh, very oversized pathways, plazas. Yeah, there were a lot of trees, but it was not this green oasis. When you think about green oasis in the city of New York, you immediately think about Central Park. Central Park, um, designed by Olmsted, was in reality a swamp. And what he did with it is he transformed it into this beautiful park that we all know. And so we took inspiration to the way he thought about a flat landscape that was previously not accessible into a landscape that is fully accessible for everybody to enjoy, who has topography in it, who has water in it, who has open space in it. The beauty of an island is that you actually have 360 degrees uh, view. So we knew immediately that that was something we had to deal with. Because when you walk along the island, you basically can see every borough of the city of New York. From Manhattan to Queens and back to Jersey, um, you see the city of New York. And because the island is laying just under the skirt of Manhattan, we immediately understood that there was something that we had to do. We had to compensate that in one way or the other. And the, the idea was to build an island with topography. Change it from a flat pancake to a landscape with topography. So the whole idea is topography. And here you see what happened. The existing situation of the island on top with the existing fortress when Sandy hit New York, the blue area was fully underwater. Or at least that was what would happen. Because we came first and we said, the island here on the south tip, that's the park, that's publicly accessible. That's going to be flood free. So we transformed the landscape from a underwater landscape to a landscape that sits above the sea level. By just creating landscape. By using what we know as landscape architects is what we know. Grass, trees, topography, paths, benches, and light. That's what the identities are of this park. And the story starts very si simple. You're boarding the, the, the ferry at Manhattan, you take the free, free uh, ferry to the island, and you're welcomed by landscape. It says, welcome to the governor's island, but from the moment you enter the, 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 the garden, you're faced with Hortensia. You're immediately in your garden. You're immediately into the place where you want to be. And then we made sure that people understood where they go to. Wayfinding, super important so that you know where to go to. So, the big map of Governor's Island, the tip of the island is an old historical fortress which we had to stay off. Um, we were not allowed to touch that. Um, we're now 2017 and we are allowed to touch that, so we're now working on a design for that fortress and how to make that beautiful. And there's in a way three stages into the park. And I'm starting with Legacy Terrace. Legacy Terrace is a formal old building as part of the military industry that um, is fully going to be renovated, is fully going to be taken over with a lot of uh, program, similar to what we see here in the park. We looked at it from an idea of a garden. When you enter the garden, you enter your terrace. Okay, this, this building also needs a terrace. What does the terrace in this situation look like? We think it's a combination of space for people to hang out, for program to take place, and for landscape to happen. In this case, a uh, boxwood landscape of uh, a formal, almost a formal in the, uh, French garden, uh, but then with a, a new touch to it. 
Step by step, people are taking it over. Uh, food tents are coming, um, terraces are built, and we just inserted even more program with fountains. The next step when you go into your garden, when you go into your own backyard, you go from the terrace into your garden. Our garden is basically a forest, a forest of trees, and we call it the hammock grove. Um, because it can be super hot in New York, we wanted to cool down the temperature a lot. And by doing, the only way by doing that is to plant a canopy of trees. We planted 40 different species, 1,800 new trees were planted on the island in different heights, in different stages of um, their growth. And these are some of the images uh, uh, that we made. The problem with it, and the US Landscape Party takes notice, is when you build into a river who has a very easy connection to the sea, it is actually brackish water. There's not a lot, of, a lot of trees who love to grow in brackish water. So we raised the whole island uh, with topography to create more distance from this brackish water so that we have natural water to deal with. You can't raise the whole island. So we created cushions for those trees to sit in with a simple, beautiful curbstone around it. We shaped the landscape that is a base for um, that forest to grow in. You see the curb stones are just a very simple, I'll call it the eyeliner again, around the, the, the pillows. And it's planted in and seeded in with thousands of trees and flowers. And it's been taken over by the people, enjoying just walking through this garden. And playing with that skyline that sits on the back. Of course there's more to do than just hanging out into a park, walking and cycling into a park. It is also about just hanging out, being there, creating space to put a pillow on, on or a blanket onto the grass and enjoy, enjoying that space. Again, we've had a program to it, because program is why people are coming to this place. A big playground. Multiple art features have been placed into this area. And then last but not least, hammocks, because that's where the name hammock grows comes from. So a lot of hammocks have been put into the grass so that people could go and enjoy this landscape. It's fully publicly accessible. You have to fight now to get one of those hammocks if you want to stay here for that. But what it does, it creates this green oasis at the foot of Manhattan. And then the last item is to think about that, that, compens that, that thing that compensates Manhattan in one way or the other. Can we build topography? Can we build something that allows us to play with the skyline on the back? And here you see the transformation of topography. And what we've done is, as you, if, you even, if you remember the existing picture, there were a lot of existing buildings on the site. We uh, basically removed all of them, we imploded them. And um, does this mean I need to stop? Um, so what we basically did, we asked demolish all of the buildings, keep the material on site, and refurbish it. Um, use it to build a hill width. What we've done with is we use that existing debris to build hills width that are 25 meters high. Step by step, we built this over the many years. And what you see is all about the way you can play with topography and about that skyline that you can see in the backdrop. It's all about the, 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 the area around it. And so four hills, different elevations, different identities, who all play their own role, who all have their own function within the place that they are. So the hills are fully accessible with a, a, a concrete walkway that brings you up on the hill. But we had more. When the island was restored before we came on site, a lot of old granite blocks were found. They were dumped onto a site somewhere close to our uh, construction site and we said we need to do something with that. What we did with it is we built a scramble. It's and a scramble is basically a stair of old existing granite blocks that we found on site. We could not tell our contractor how to build this, so we had to be on site building this with him. And step by step we understood how we could do this. But still, this is not per code. It's in, you still have to make sure that people don't fall and trip. And so what we did is we invited school kids to test this out, to see if this would be accessible to them. Because if they can get there, then everybody can get there. Because in a way, they're the most critical people that are existing uh, when you talk about parks. And so very early on, we understood what they wanted, how they wanted to play with it, and we continue building this park. Um, planted in with thousands of uh, 
uh, ground covers and trees again and it allows people now to see the skyline of New York. I'm standing at the tip of uh, the island and I'm looking back towards Manhattan. And it's for the first time that people can actually see the 360 degree of uh, the city and it's an amazing place to just hang out. If you're going to New York, take the free shuttle um, boat to the island and go and enjoy it for an hour, a half a day, or a day. It is something you can just do. But in reality, it's all about playing with the existing context. Every hill, as said, has its own context or its own identity. This one has slides on it. The steepest slides uh, that are existing in uh, North America, because we wanted to have a challenge. Um, and so a series of slides has been built in uh, this park. And I think I'm going to end up with one more feature that not only are we building, well, we do pavilions, we do uh, parks, we do infrastructure, but we do also a lot of bridges. Because that's also part of the, 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 the language that we as landscape architects speak. What we're talking about is a bridge that needs to connect the Belgium coastline across the dunes to a village that sits on the other side. Um, okay, let's connect it with a bridge there. How does that bridge look like? What kind of identity do we need to use? How does it support? That's the story about. The image is where it is located on the, the plan drawing. The vision is very simple. There's a lot of wood and debris that comes at the shorelines of uh, the coast. Can we do something with that rack wood? Can we do something with fun with it? And what we designed is a bridge that takes that identity of that wood and plays with it. And um, so we designed a wooden bridge to walk through, think about that cross wood when it falls at the shoreline of the coastline, uh, round, flat pieces of wood, it doesn't matter, let's reuse that all into a structure that allows you to walk over and across a very messy highway that runs there. Renders of uh, renderings and the uh, models of how we build it. And this is step by step we build it. So the base idea is to build a wooden bridge. It has a lot of structure in it that is steel. But the idea remains wood as a rack wood. How do you play with that? How do you detail that out? How do you make something that is so simple, the way wood drifts at the shoreline? And how do you make that in an experience for people to walk through? And how could that look like? Um, that was the question we posed ourselves, and step by step this bridge has been built and fully open to the public, integrated into the landscape of dunes on one side and the city on the other side, and now it creates this pedestrian walkway from the village across the dunes towards the beach, so that people don't have to cross uh, the busy highway anymore. And with this, I'm going to end my story. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask them. Thank you, Mayeli. I remind you that the questions will be asked, right? Hello, sir. Thank you for your presentation. I want uh, to ask uh, some questions about uh, your, uh, your work is uh, pretty like uh, in some projects like uh, the work of God. So you change its nature and, uh, and how do you know what your project will uh, work good? Because you uh, change the bioclimate and the natural, natural conditions. So let's start with the idea that we are not gods. <laughs> <laughs> No, we are landscape architects who look very carefully to the existing context and how you deal with the existing context. How do you transform that into something new by rebuilding identity. It's really about thinking about the identity for that spot and then using everything that you've got as a landscape architect to build that project in. So, um, projects may look different after a while. Yes, you go from a parking lot to a hillside landscape. It's because that is what is important to that place. It's important to the way you think about sustainability. It's about thinking about how nature is transforming the place where we are in. So it's not about taking one program of element like we need to build a park. It's about picking the elements that are important. In this case, sustainability. In some cases, environmentality. Uh, it's about creating space for people to enjoy. So you need to multiply 
the program, it's not about one element. It's about multiplying the different layers on top of each other, closing that into one design. That's the, that's the deal that we do day in, day out in the office. So we create public spaces that exist out of more than one element. Thank you. Буде ще запитання. Може ти на російській чи українській, єлі буде переводчик? Є бажаючі? Є запитання? Немає? Тоді будемо дякувати єлі.